Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another Discover Wildlife evening. Um, for those who have been before, thanks for coming back. And for those who are new, welcome. Um, I am Emma Healy. For those who don't know me, I work for Wildlife Worldwide as a travel consultant and a photography tour leader. Um, and this evening, we are heading off to Brazil. Um, we've got Nick Garbutt with us. Uh, evening, everyone award-winning fabulous photographer walking encyclopedia of all things Madagascar um so yeah tonight we're going to the Pantanal um which is somewhere I was lucky enough to head to for the first time in 2019 um and fell in love straight away just with the variety and amount of wildlife so looking forward to seeing it but um yeah over to you Nick thank you Emma once again good evening everyone um I'm going to take you on a whistle stop tour around the Pantanal, which I visited for the first time 10, 11 years ago, and I'm pretty sure I've been back seven or eight times. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, it's worthwhile just getting your head around the geography. And over the course of the talk, what I'll do is explain how the different regions of the Pantanal differ from one another and their pros and cons when it comes to organizing um, a visit and whether you want to combine one area with another, et cetera, et cetera. So a little bit of background. Um, the Pantanal is indeed the world's largest wetland and it sits absolutely smack bang in the center of South America, as you can see from this map. The Amazon to the north, the Andes to the west and the Cerrado grasslands to the east. And then obviously, as you go further south, down into Pampas and way down towards Patagonia, far south. So absolutely in the heart of um, South America. And the thing that makes, or the, the major factor that makes it so um, spectacular is the annual pulse of water that floods through its, it, Geographically, it's like a giant bowl. So the water that floods through the Pantanal, creating the world's largest wetland, most of that water actually doesn't fall in the Pantanal itself. It falls in the areas, the upland areas that border it to the north, the east and the south. And then that water then flows down into the Pantanal. And so it's a very seasonal area. Um, and that has a considerable influence over when you might wish to visit and what you uh, would potentially see. So generally speaking, the wet time of year when the area is completely flooded starts from sort of mid-October into November and continues through until May time. So any visit during that period would be dominated by water. Outside that period, particularly end of June, July, August, September, early October, it's getting drier and drier and drier. And that means the water is more and more concentrated around the streams and rivers and consequently and the pools and still water areas. And consequently, the wildlife becomes much more concentrated around the wet areas, the water, remaining water as well. So a bit of geography, a little bit more as well. Broadly speaking, you can divide the Pantanal, at least in Brazil, 90% of the Pantanal is in Brazil, just a smidge in Bolivia and a sliver in Paraguay, as you can see from this map. Broadly speaking, you can divide the Pantanal into two, the Northern Pantanal, which is in Mato Grosso. And if you're looking at this map, it's to the north of that wiggly blue and red line, uh, just above Brazil, the word Brazil. And then south of that line, Mato Grosso do Sul, is the southern Pantanal. And in terms of visiting, you're really only dipping into the areas just to the north and then coming up from the very bottom just into the south. That great central area is virtually impossible to get into and doesn't have very much in the way of tourism infrastructure. So I'm going to start by talking a bit about the North Pantanal, which is the most visited parts of the region and certainly perhaps the most familiar. You would fly into the city of Cuiaba, as you can see at the top of this map, and then drive south down to Pocone, and then just south of Pocone, the Pantanal begins. Um, and you can see that 
all of the towns and cities are to the north. And then once you get south of Pocomi, there's nothing. And um, it's all wilderness area and ranch land. There's very little in the way of permanent habitation. Unlike other spectacular wildlife areas, a lot of the Pantanal is not a national park or any sort of protected area. An awful lot of it, a lot of it is under private ownership, uh, enormous ranches, cattle ranches. So the area is a mixture, a mosaic of ranching land, grassland, woodland and water areas, wet areas that seasonally flood. Um, and in terms of visiting, most of the places you would visit would be private ranchers that have their own tourism facilities, their own lodge, estancia, um, pousada, as they are called in uh, Portuguese. Um, and so you would choose to visit different ranchers, different pousadas in different places in the Pantanal that would offer different experiences. So you're not necessarily visiting protected areas, they're private areas that are managed with both cattle ranching in mind and wildlife viewing in mind. And the road that you see heading south between Pocone and Porto Joffre is the famous Transpantiniera, a dirt come um, cinder road with lots and lots of wooden bridges across the waterways that gradually allows you to head south into deeper and deeper into the Pantanel or to, all the way down to Porto Joffre where uh, it intersects with the Cuiaba River, more of that later. So dotted along the Transpantiniera are various posadas, lodges that you can choose to stay at, of varying qualities and offering different sorts of experience. So this is the beginning of the Transpantiniera where most trips to the Pantanal will begin. Um, most of the pictures, in fact, virtually all of the pictures you're going to see uh, are uh, were taken on obviously on trips that I did, which have been primarily between middle of July through August towards end of September, just into early October. So the driest time of the year. And obviously you can see from this photograph that the area here is very, very dry. Um, the very Northern part of the Pantanal is the driest part of the region, um, dries out fastest after the flood and obviously takes longer to receive um, new floodwaters as well. So the fact that it's drier means that the sorts of wildlife that you see in the very north of the Pantanal changes or is different to that that you will see further south. And I'll allude to that as we move on. Um, but the amazing thing is that as soon as you get into the Pantanal, you just start seeing so much wildlife straight away. The entrance to the Pantanal is often heralded by these amazing um, puerval trees, often in bloom with either yellow or in this case, pink flowers. Um, and almost straight away, particularly in the dry season, you would start to see huge aggregations of wildlife around the still water areas, even right next to the road. Huge congregations of Yakiri caiman, obviously caiman are the, um, the crocodile um, uh, uh, group that are, um, native to South America. Um, and the particular one that's very, very common in the Pantanal is the Yakiri caiman. And they've become so concentrated around the waterways that you just see them in these great aggregations. Um, bird life too, particularly where there's um, water at the very top of the Transpantine area can be so abundant. These are wood stalks and the occasional roseate spoonbill. And you'll see aggregations and flocks of water birds like this with herons and egrets and all sorts, almost straight away in huge numbers at various places. Lots of beautiful roseate spoonbills often, and other birds that you'll become very familiar with very quickly, things like southern lapwings. Um, this is a bird, a red-legged seriema, that is generally only found to the very northern part of the Pantanal because it's a dry area specialist. Heading further south, it will disappear. So it's a bird that you see at the very northern part of the Transpantiniera, but thereafter you wouldn't see it very much. Also down in the very south, southern part of the Pantanal, you would see it, but it's a dry area specialist. 
This is an example of one of the lodges um, at the northern part of the Pantanal. I think this is Puyaval Lodge, which is one of the first that you come to. Um, and a very nice place for getting a general introduction. It's about a two and a half, three hour drive from um, uh, Quiaba, so it's within easy reach. And it's worth staying a couple of nights to get a general introduction to that northern area of the Pantanal. If you head a little further south down, maybe another 30 plus kilometers south into the Pantanal, um, you come to uh, Araras Lodge, which is again another one of my favorites, and I often on certainly my group trips spend um, several nights here where possible, because it's a really good amalgamation of dry areas and wet areas that gives a wonderful diversity of wildlife. And it's a really nice lodge. Most of the lodges in and around um, the Pantanal are not anything like the super luxurious lodges that you might maybe have been to in Africa or so forth. The general standard is lower, but somewhere like Araras Lodge is still a lovely, lovely lodge, um, very good standard indeed, top quality food, very comfortable and everything that you would hope and expect and need. Um, and uh, certainly an excellent place to stay. And like lodges elsewhere in the world, they're magnets for wildlife and you see so much in and around the lodge. There are no fences or barriers to the wildlife, so things just come and go, birds, mammals, whatever, and are passing through the lodge, around the lodge all the time. Here's a barefoot, pair of barefaced Curacao, um, other common birds that you'd become very familiar with quickly include uh, chestnut-eared arasaris, one of the smaller toucans, and the famous Guinness toucan, of course, the toco toucan. More often than not, those that aren't in the know would associate this bird with rainforest. It's not a rainforest bird at all. Um, it's a dry um, forest inhabitant, and um, the drier areas of the Pantanal are um, where it's very common. And so most of the lodges that you would visit in the northern Pantanal and in the southern Pantanal, for that matter, are places that you would see toco toucans coming to visit uh, bird feeders, etc. One of the most um, sought after birds to see on any visit to the Pantanal is um, this bird. This is the world's largest parrot, the hyacinth macaw, um, and most lodges um, in both the North and South Pantanal have hyacinth macaws associated with them now. They became incredibly rare um, 20, 30 years ago, partly through habitat destruction, particularly the destruction of the trees that they nest in, but more so because of overcollection for the pet trade. They are hugely sought after uh, with the, for the pet trade and command colossal prices. So their numbers plummeted but there's been a concerted effort to um, conserve them with um, most of the major lodges involved in providing artificial nest boxes and nest sites for them um, and helping with captive breeding and then reintroduction. So numbers have bounced back spectacularly and places like Araras Lodge have pairs associated with them or several pairs associated with them that fly around the lodge and are very easily seen. So these shots were all taken in and around Alaris Lodge where um, there are at least two or three pairs of hyacinth macaws generally nesting. Even around at night around the lodge, there's plenty to see owls like this striped owl, there are ferruginous pygmy owls and plenty of other things that you will see within a couple of hundred yards of the lodge and you're free to just bumble around with a torch and look yourself. One of the beauties of any trip to the Pantanal, particularly these drier areas, is that you have the opportunity not only to go out on game drives, um, but you can go out on foot as well um, during the day. Um, boardwalks like this will take you over marshland areas towards woodland and um, forested areas that you can see in the distance. And there's plenty of opportunity to view wildlife at your own pace. A lot of the lodges will have tree towers constructed at various points, so you can spend time up those looking for wildlife. Um, but there's a very sort of free and easy access because you're on private land, so you're not being dictated to by things like national park rules, and you can do whatever the lodge says is appropriate. And things like caiman like this have become very habituated, and pools around the lodge will often have half a dozen caiman in, um, 
and you're able to get reasonably close entirely safely. And you get a, a sort of idea of the numbers of caiman if you go out at night and just shine a torch. So this is a pool that's less than 100 yards away from the lodge, uh, Araras Lodge, um, just with a torch at night. And you can see how many, and bear in mind, each one of those dots is a caiman. So, and that's just one small part of the pool. So that gives you the sort of indication. There are far more there than is apparent during the day, because a lot of them are tucked away in vegetation or they're submerged under the water, etc. But at night, they become much more visible by torchlight, or at least their presence is much more apparent. Some of the other mammals that you might see in and around the lodge or the adjacent areas of forest, things like this Serraris agouti, um, one of the many rodent species, um, lovely yellow armadillo, again, very common, not necessarily easy to see, but common. Um, one of the very um, frequently encountered carnivores, this is a crab-eating fox. Um, and an animal that everyone dearly wishes to see when they go to the Pantanal, this is a, a tamandua, um, a type of, or sometimes called a lesser anteater. And certainly if you head out for a walk really early in the morning at first light, there's a good chance you might come across a tamandu. They're generally nocturnal, but they may well stay active for the first hour, hour and a half of daylight while it remains cool. So these photographs um, were taken early in the morning when we encountered one, as you can see, females carry youngsters on their back and incredibly endearing. Um, so that first hour of daylight, there's often a chance of finding one as they're heading back to their tree holes where they sleep during the day and then become active again at night. Um, you may well, if you're very lucky, see giant anteaters in the northern Pantanal, but it's not the best place to see giant anteater. I'll come back to that a little later. They're pretty sporadic, so you'd have to be lucky to see one in the northern part of the Pantanal, but it does happen. Um, on one occasion, I even found one that was ridiculously tolerant and habituated, but it's not something you would ever rely on in the northern part of the Pantanal. It would be, you'd need to have a slice of luck for, to be able to see them. Um, but again, going out at night increases your chances. Around the many pools and wetlands, um, stream areas that most of these posadas have associated with them, there are fantastic um, uh, collections of different species of bird, aggregations of bird, obviously wetland birds in particular. This is the rufescent tiger heron, very, very common indeed. Much harder to see, but well worth looking for if you can, is an agami heron, which is certainly, I think, perhaps the most beautiful of the heron group. Um, but they're very secretive and tend to stay in really dark, um, shady areas. So finding one and photographing one, uh, I've only seen them two or three times, but got very lucky on one occasion to be able to get these photographed and several others. A bird you will see more often is a sun bittern, which um, feeds on insects that are um, skittering around on the water surface and are very common again around most of the water courses. They don't look particularly spectacular like that, but if you manage to catch one when it's displaying, they're incredibly spectacular. So this actually wasn't displaying, it was just drying its wings, but males form a wonderful um, sort of circle with their wings when they're displaying to females um, and uh, that's when they get their name from because the, the discs are thought to represent or look like the sun. And some of the birds that would nest above water, weaver bird equivalents, there are no weavers in South America of course, but there are birds that weave nests in a similar vein. These are yellow rumped caciques that are communal nesters and um, uh, form big colonies where Lots of nests um, are woven together like this. And there are even predators of these, just like in Africa, things like gymnogenes or harrier hawks will predate weaver bird nests. This is an ecological equivalent of a harrier hawk. It's called a crane hawk. It even looks vaguely similar to a harrier hawk. And they have double jointed limbs, so they're able to hang upside down and try and um, extract chicks from inside the nests of birds like the cacique that you saw in the previous image. Some other birds often associated with water, an orange-backed troupial, lovely splash of colours, um, relative of the orioles. 
and much, much harder to see, of course, exquisite camouflage. This is a great potu, a nocturnal bird that's sort of halfway between an owl and a nightjar, but spends the day absolutely motionless on a tree trunk like this, mimicking the bark and are obviously incredibly difficult to find. And lovely green iguanas tend to be very common as well along waterways. This is a huge male. This was the best part of two, not two, meter and a half long, certainly six feet. Um, uh, so waterways in particular are very good places to look for green iguanas. And in the woodland areas that you can wander into, there are several species of primate that you may come across. Tufted capuchins are one of the most common. Um, if you don't see them, you will certainly hear black howlers, the black being the males, the golden colored ones are the females, and the long waterways, they're often resting in the trees. You might get lucky and see marmosets as well in some of the deciduous forests that you're able to wander into. Whenever you're visiting these parts of the Pantanal, as I mentioned, you can go out on foot, you could go out on horseback if you so wished, or you can go out on game drives or along the streams in small boats. So there's a whole variety of ways of seeing the different areas and getting an appreciation of the wildlife. Obviously on the photography tours that I do, we tend to concentrate on foot and in vehicles because it, because it maximizes um, photography opportunities, but we will spend time in the, the um, tree platforms on the towers and so forth where there are good opportunities and indeed in the small boats if they're able to offer opportunities that you wouldn't be able to get any other way. So if you then head further south from that so the very northern part of the Transpantine area, by which I'm really meaning the top, most northerly 40 kilometres you then carry on down the Transpantine era and go through large areas where there aren't that many lodges that are set up really for tourism. And most of the time you would then head south to go all the way down to Port Joffrey and the Cuiaba River, where there's a huge amount to see. Um, and you can either stay at the hotel right at the end of the road, which is smack bang on the river. This is the um, Pantanal Nor Hotel um, that was built as a fishing lodge, but now runs primarily as a wildlife lodge. Or there are any number of options to move on from here and stay at smaller lodges up or generally upstream, or even some of the floating lodges. Now there are pros and cons to that. They're floating lodges being converted paddle boats and so forth that are generally moored up um, during the dry season for wildlife viewing. The primary reason that people head to this particular location is that it has become without doubt the best known place to look for jaguars. And any visit to this part of the Pantanal will really focus on trying to see jaguars. There's so much else to see as I will shortly show you, but jaguars are without doubt the primary reason that most people would go to this particular location um, in the Pantanal. And so most of the lodges, whether they be on land or the floating lodges, are geared up for Jaguar viewing where possible. <clears throat> Behind Pantanal Nor Hotel, there's a wonderful lake um, where at times you can see fantastic collections of giant lilies. And if any of you, I'm sure you have been watching Green Planet, the um, uh, wetland water episode had those wonderful sequences of um, giant lilies that were filmed partially in the Pantanal as an, in an area on the extreme west of the Pantanal and also some of the sequences were filmed uh, just down the road from where I live in Devon believe it or not in a staged setup but nonetheless I was bowled over by some of that wonderful footage and the, the sort of competitive exclusion um, techniques that giant water lilies used to exclude competitors and so forth. It was fascinating to see those time lapses, but they're just wonderful plants to, to obviously see in their pomp and offer plenty of photographic opportunities. This was a shot that I took on that lake right at the back of um, Pantanal Nor Hotel. And would you believe it's in the Green Planet book? So there you go. Um, you don't have to go far and wide to, uh, to get shots that end up earning you a few quid. Um, but of course, most people 
go to Port of Joffrey um, to spend time on the river to look for the jaguars and other wildlife. A typical day would start at 5.30, quarter to six, out at first light onto the river, because you can start seeing wildlife instantly. Um, here's some um, taco toucans flying over the river, but it's just such an evocative place, misty mornings, um, plenty of bird song, howlers calling and so on and so forth, and the chance of bumping into large predators, not only the jaguars, but there's other stuff to see as well. But it's so rich in wildlife, and particularly during the dry season where the wildlife has become so much more concentrated around the remaining wet areas. <clears throat> Lots of caiman to see, um, as always, along any of the waterways, always very photogenic. I'm struggling to find the name or an identity of this particular, I think it's a type of hoverfly, but you always see them in large numbers around Cayman and nowhere else, but I've not been able to identify it. So if anyone happens to know what this hoverfly is, I'd be intrigued to find out. Um, unfortunately, um, occasionally they meet a sorry end. So this is a Cayman that was killed by, I assume, a boat propeller, but um, provided a meal for this black vulture. Um, and other things that you will see are plenty as you're um, going up and down the Cuiaba River and the various tributaries like the Pikiri River and the um, Three Brothers Rivers. Um, capybara, the world's largest rodent, you will see plenty of capybara. Um, lots of behaviour. Here's a mum suckling her infants. And they're very, very tolerant, as you can see, um, just drifting up in a boat to a stationary position and they really do not mind at all. So it's a very good chance of getting very close, not only to capybara, but other wildlife. It's worth just mentioning boats because of course, down at Port of Joffrey, you're doing virtually all of the wildlife viewing from a boat, which not only influences how you interact and see the wildlife, it has a strong influence on how you're able to photograph it. Not all trips are created equal. You will see some trips which turn into a bit of a horror show like this, where groups are crammed into boats that are A, too small, or B, there are too many people in a boat for everyone to get a worthwhile view. And obviously, as a photographer, that would be hugely frustrating. Um, so one of the things that we certainly make sure of doing on the trips that I'm involved with, where photography is obviously very much a priority, is to make sure you have a reasonable amount of space. So there's never a seat in the middle, which there often can be in other boats. Now, of course, the downside of this is that it makes the trips more expensive because the hotels charge effectively per seat. And we've taken some of the seats out. So we get charged for those. But of course, the plus side is that you get so much more space. So there's even space to set up a tripod and use a long lens from these boats. And it just allows you a much better experience, not only seeing the wildlife, but certainly if photography is a priority, then you would get monumentally frustrated if you were in a boat with too many people. Lots of bird life to see. Um, Jabaroos, huge stalk, very reminiscent of um, marabou stalks, of course, are very common and readily seen along the waterways, particularly the larger rivers. Cockoy herons, these are all birds you will see virtually on every time you go out on the water. Um, less often seen, but still um, reasonably frequently is something like a capped heron. And this is a grey breasted um, wood rail, again, often seen. And this one's picking up um, scavenging from, I assume it is a fish killed by a caiman. This is a type of uh, striped tiger catfish that's been killed, I would guess, by a caiman. And this wood rail is managing to do a little bit of scavenging. Um, Ringed kingfishers too, very, very common. Excellent place to see a whole variety of kingfishers. I think there are four or five species you have a good chance of seeing in and around the Pantanal and certainly along the Cuiaba River, you would see routinely three, four species every day. Far harder to see, requiring a big stroke of luck um, would be king vultures, but along these rivers, they are seen from time to time. This is an adult with a juvenile. And, um, those of you who may know me know that I adore snakes. So something like this, um, I find hugely exciting. This is a yellow anaconda. 
perhaps less well known than its more famous Amazonian cousin, the green anaconda, and not as large, but still substantial snakes. This particular individual was over three meters long and they're, they're a type of water boa. Um, green anacondas are only found in the Amazon area. So the Pantanal is dominated by um, yellow anacondas and there's a reasonable chance you'll see one, but often just curled up um, in, uh, at the water's edge somewhere. Um, as this particular one was. But you do see them on land occasionally as well. One of the other top carnivores that um, you are almost certain to see are giant otters. I would strongly suspect the Pantanal is now the best place there is in South America to see giant otters um, because they've become so much more habituated with the increase in tourism, the increase in boat traffic, etc. So they're very territorial and as you move up and down river, you would pass through the territories of several groups um, where there are halts and often you will see interaction between different groups um, at boundaries or just plenty of play and activity like all otters. They're incredibly active, boisterous animals hunting all the time. So um, most days when you're out on the Cuiaba River or in various tributaries, you would come across at least one group of giant otters. Um, and if you get lucky, you catch them feeding or hunting and so forth and get to see plenty of behavior. If you're really lucky, you even see them interacting with other wildlife. I've been lucky enough on a couple of occasions even to see them interacting with jaguars. Rarer, uh, or not necessarily rarer, but certainly harder to see because they tend to be very shy, um, are tapir, which often will come down during the day to drink. They tend to be nocturnal, so they're harder to see during the day and even occasionally you might catch one crossing over and swimming across the river. And onto the spotted cats that of course everyone wants to see, but this is the smaller of the, the spotted cats in the Pantanal. This is an ocelot, much less frequently seen than um, jaguars now, but still nonetheless, um, there's a reasonable chance you might come across an ocelot prowling along the riverbanks as these were. Um, I've seen them a handful of times um, and as more and more people have started visiting the Pantanal and tourism has increased, obviously animals like this have become more and more tolerant. There, is, there are lodges that have bait stations now where you can go and see ocelots and obviously there are pros and cons to that and it's not necessarily everyone's cup of tea to indulge in that sort of thing, but it offers the opportunity to see an animal that otherwise you perhaps wouldn't. But of course, the main attraction of the Cuiaba River and its tributaries are jaguars. Um, as I mentioned, it's probably the best place there is to see jaguars, certainly on a regular basis. And to give you an idea, if you go and have a three or four night stay and do morning and afternoon boat trips, you would expect now probably to see jaguars on half the boat trips. And sometimes you, if you got very lucky, you could see them on every boat trip. That would be exceptional. But if you put in three or four days at port -au joffre you would be monumentally unlucky now to miss out on seeing jaguars. When I first went, it was still more challenging 10, 11 years ago. This was the very first jaguar I saw. Not a bad first sighting, is it? There's a, magnificent male that um, was swimming through water hyacinth and then emerged out onto the bank um, and it, I saw this on my third boat trip on the river so you know I was thrilled but conversely at that time um, I was talking to people who'd been there for four days and hadn't seen one so um, I got very lucky but as I mentioned, it's become so much easier now as cats have become more habituated and the, nobody knows how many jaguars there are in this particular area. The num it's impossible to keep tabs on them, but it's substantial. We're probably talking anywhere between 50 and 100 cats, if not more. And obviously each year that changes. There are some that are recognizable year on year. Um, but there's there's a very very substantial population and some of them are very tolerant others much shyer but generally speaking you know you're going to get good encounters and as you can see from this shot there are times they're just now it's just like seeing lions in africa or whatever they're completely and utterly tolerated tolerant of being viewed this female is you can see she's whelping she's obviously got 
cubs tucked away and she's suckling them because she's um, very he heavily laden with milk. Um, and magnificent males like this jag um, come down to the water to drink. And it's, it's just a question of putting in the time. You just cruise along the waterway slowly looking, listening for sounds of monkey alarm calls or um, capybara alarm calls, because the jaguars are coming down to the edge of the water, primarily to hunt, because the two things that they hunt 90%, 95% of their meals um, at the dry time of year are caiman or capybara. So virtually all of their hunting is done along the river's edges. This is a magnificent male that was actually courting a female. And we were aware she, uh, the pair were tucked away just out of sight um, in a dense thicket next to the riverbank. And we decided to wait. Lots of other boats came and went, came and went. We decided to wait. And we were rewarded with this magnificent view of this male bursting from cover and then the female came out and so forth and again just like all wildlife watching it pays to be patient and persistent and I my policy always is if you're with a jaguar if you can't see it just wait because eventually it'll become visible and at times you know the uh, this cat was walking through the shallows no more than about 12 meters away from the boat utterly unperturbed this is a female and you can see how different they are in stature. And to give you a sort of broad idea, um, a moderate sized female jaguar is about the size of a male leopard. And you can see from her stature that she's quite thick set, but compared to a male, a male is almost like a Rottweiler in cat's clothing. They're so much thicker set and stronger and more powerful. Um, and one of the other things that's worth bearing in mind, again, that's slightly different to perhaps viewing cats elsewhere in the world, is that jaguars, because they're hunting capybara and caiman along the rivers, can be active at any time, even in the middle of the day. You know, you go to Africa and from 8.30 onwards, you kind of think, well, not much is going to be happening because everything's asleep. But certainly the lions and so forth, they're all asleep in the middle of the day. Not so the jaguars. They will hunt right throughout the day. This shot was taken at midday, and this female had attempted to hunt a caiman and had failed, and then carried on, swam across the river, and went off to hunt some more. So you can be out on the water an awful lot, and it does get very hot. So um, that's something to bear in mind. But Generally speaking, uh, morning trips, you're starting at 5.30, quarter to six, and you may not get back to the lodge until midday. You'll have two and a half, three hours break, and then you're back on the river at three o'clock until dusk. So you put in the time. You certainly do put in the time. But as I say, you're seeing lots of action. This is that same female um, that you've just seen when she tried to hunt a caiman. Obviously, this is a Photoshop montage of images, but we were able to watch her stalk in and then sprint down this sandbar towards the caiman. And you get the sort of full extent of her sprint from this sequence as she ran 30 meters down the sandbar to try and catch the caiman, which um, she failed to do. But nonetheless, all of this happened in broad daylight, um, virtually at midday. Likewise, here we are, here's quite literally cat and mouse. Uh, this is a capybara swimming across the river being watched by a jaguar. Um, and here's a jaguar attempting to hunt a capybara. If you haven't picked the jaguar up, it's bottom left of the picture. And it got within a couple of meters before the capybara realized and alarm called and swam off. And here's another attempted hunt. I, I thought I was, when this particular incident happened, I was in for a potential wildlife photograph of the year with the jaguar in midair as it was catching a capybara. But believe it or not, the jaguar didn't actually jump and these two capybara dived down before it actually had a chance to, I was convinced the jaguar was gonna launch itself into the water to catch one, but it didn't. But if you get lucky, you might come across a successful predation. You're not, not too lucky for the capybara, of course, but this was an incident in one of the side channels and we were all actually turned around through 180 degrees looking in the opposite direction because we'd been watching a jaguar and we're anticipating it coming out onto the bank 
where we were looking, we suddenly heard a commotion, turned round, and 50 yards away, this female had just managed to successfully catch a capybara in the water's edge. And we, until that point, we were blissfully unaware there was another jaguar in the vicinity. You also may get lucky and see interaction between males and females. So this is a, a male on the right and a female on the left that eventually did mate. And if you get very lucky, you might even get to see the result of the mating. And here you are as a female with a cub. Um, I've only seen cubs on a three or four occasions, young cubs like this, about three months old. But I know I've not been to the Pantanal now for four years. Obviously, the last two years have been a write-off. Um, and my last visit was two years prior to that. But I certainly know, based on following people I do on Instagram, who I know that run trips in this part of the world, that seeing cubs is becoming more and more frequent because more and more jaguars have become tolerant. One of the other things I would like to talk about and stress is the, you know, the overcrowding issue, which certainly can be um, a problem at um, Portage Offrey and along the Cuyaba River because it has become so popular. But one of the good things is that the system is self-policing and the vast majority of the reputable boatmen um, sign up to a self-policing code so if they behave inappropriately they get reported people take pictures on mobile phones and they get banned so the system works very very well and generally speaking even if there is an aggregation of boats like this they back away from the water's edge so they give the cat space but the beauty of Portage Offrey is that there's such a vast amount of waterway to investigate and discover and there are so many jaguars to potentially find that if you come across an aggregation like this and you've already you know, if you've never seen a jaguar before of course you're going to have, want to have a look but if you've already seen your first jaguar i would always say move on and just go and find another one because there's every chance you will so you don't need to get involved in large aggregations of boats so certainly on my trips I would always advocate and concentrate on keeping away from everyone else, staying in the quieter waterways, and eventually you'll find a cat and you'll have it to yourself. Okay, we're going to move on from Portage Offrey now to a much less visited part of the Pantanal, way over on the west side. If you can see Kesserus on the map, um, up towards the northwest corner, and then imagine heading due south from Kesserus into that area where all of those little lakes are apparent. That's an area called Teamar on the Paraguay River, which is the very towards the very western edge of the Pantanal. Much less visited, far fewer facilities, but nonetheless another wonderful experience, river experience, very, very similar to Cuiaba, except that it's so much quieter. Nice basic but nice lodge to stay at, perfectly adequate, no frills, but perfectly pleasant. Um, and just a wonderful experience because that's really the only place to stay. So the only people that are going out looking for the cats and other wildlife are the people at that lodge, which tends to be whichever group you're with, because it's such a small lodge, it can't take more than one group of wildlife watchers at one time. So certainly when I go there, with my groups, there's virtually nobody else there. There might be a few fishermen and so forth, but there's virtually no one else looking for wildlife. The advantage of that, of course, is when, is that when you find it, you have it to yourself. The disadvantage is you're the only people looking, so sometimes you've got to work harder to find things. But the area is stunningly beautiful off the main river channels. This is on the Paraguay River. Off the main river channels, there are lots of these stunningly beautiful lagoons to explore and tributaries with just lovely narrow waterways to pootle down at your own pace and who knows what you might find but there are plenty of cats here too so this is the sort of boat we would go out in i've deliberately put this picture in because you'll notice that um, everyone is rather wrapped up there rather contrary to uh, any of the other pictures you've seen the reason being that periodically i mean normally even in the dry season, our summer, 
northern hemisphere summer, which of course is southern hemisphere winter, in the Pantanal in August, September, you'd be in temperatures higher than 30 degrees normally. So you're shorts and short sleeve shirts all of the time. However, once in a while, there's a cold front moves up from the very southern part of the continent. And overnight, the temperature absolutely plummets. So you can be out in an open boat like this and suddenly it's perishingly cold. So I just say that as a word of warning for anyone planning a trip to the Pantanal, that make sure you do have some warm clothing with you. You may find you do a trip and it never comes out of your suitcase. And more the better for that. But if you went without that clothing and a cold front did move in, you would suffer hugely. So it's just worth bearing in mind. Oops. Missed the slide there. There we go. Um, so along the Paraguay River, um, lots of other water birds to see. These, this is a southern screamer. Obviously, this is a Photoshop montage, so you can just see the sequence. This is a bird you may well have already seen at Porto Joffre, but again, common along the Paraguay River. Plenty of roseate spoonbills again, all the same sorts of water birds that you would have seen um, along the Cuiaba River. Along, in amongst the um, water hyacinths and the lagoons, you'd come across birds like, um, very vocal birds like this black cat Danacobius. And one or two deer species as well that generally are harder to see in other parts of the Pantanal. This is marsh deer and even rarer still a pampas deer. You might see brocket deer also. Plenty of capybara here being um, 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 de-ticked by water tyrants, um, cattle tyrants, sorry, not water tyrants. And again, another capybara with cattle tyrants. But of course, it's the jaguars you're going to look for. And as I stress that if you do find jaguars in these beautiful lagoons and along the river, chances are there'll be no one else there. Or if there is, it might be one other boat. There are occasionally some um, houseboats that moor up for jaguar viewing as well. But the numbers of people out looking for, the, for wildlife and the cats are far, far fewer than at um, Porto Joffrey. So your experience is much more of an individual one hunting jag jaguar hunting along the riverbank and you know they're hunting capybara this family of capybara just escaped a jaguar attack and um, we we saw the jaguar leap after them and they just managed to escape and then came swimming across the lagoon at a great rate of knots with the female still alarm calling <coughs> and if you get very lucky you might even see the jaguar swimming across the river so this was a cat that swam right across the width of the Paraguay River, which is at times best part of 800 meters wide um, and obviously being pushed downstream all the time. So the cat was in the water for probably well over a kilometer and we were able to just turn the engine off and float downstream along at the same pace as the cat was swimming, um, which was obviously magical. This is another wonderful place to see giant otters. Um, again, lots of different territories in and around, mount, around the areas that you explore on the Paraguay River. So another good place to see giant otters as well. And this was in one of the beautiful lagoons. Um, so I would, I would certainly heartily recommend an option of going to the Paraguay River in conjunction with Porto Joffrey to get that sort of balance of experience between the more busy popular place and the less busy um, off the beaten track place. We're gonna head south now. Just let me check the time, okay. We're gonna head south down to the southern part of the Pantanal where the experience really does change quite considerably. There isn't a Transpantiniera equivalent in the south. So there isn't a single road you can drive down and stay at lodges along the way. Most of the lodges are at that very southern edge of the Pantanal. You would fly into Campo Grande and then drive for about three hours to the west to access. Often at Miranda, you would access into the Pantanal there. There are fewer lodges. Some of them are very commercial, I wouldn't recommend, but the ones I will recommend, I think are beautiful. And there are some more distant ones, more remote ones along the Rio Negro that you can see along this map, which take a long time to drive to, or most often um, people would fly into them by small plane. 
<clears throat> the big difference um, with the Southern Pantanal as compared to the North is that Jaguars are less on the agenda and giant anteaters are very much more on the agenda. This is a place you're almost guaranteed seeing giant anteaters as even the road signs allude to. And often you will see anteaters quite literally crossing the road. So for whatever reason, giant anteaters are much more prevalent in the Southern Pantanal. This is without doubt, I think the premier in terms of quality premier lodge that I've been to in the Pantanal. This is um, Ecologico Refugio Cayman, Cayman Lodge, um, which you can stay in. It's not one big lodge. It, it's a central area with a couple of satellite lodges and you can stay in different places. And it's an absolutely beautiful place, very high standard. It's an enormous ranch, colossal sized ranch. So it has an active cattle ranching operation with a monumental number of cattle interspersed with a wonderful mosaic of deciduous forest, wetlands, rivers, marshes, waterways, etc., which is so rich in wildlife. And the place is run with both cattle and wildlife in harmony almost, and I'll come on to that shortly. But as you can see, it's an absolutely beautiful area around marshes and woodlands, and just so rich in all sorts of wildlife. Yellow anacondas again, this was one that was slithering across the lawn of the lodge. Um, collared peccaries are something that you will almost see on a daily basis. So um, most of the wildlife viewing at Cayman Lodge you would do um, from a vehicle, but you can go out on foot, you can do canoe trips on some of the lakes, um, and you can go out at night as well, as I will allude to. You, if you're into horse riding, that's always an option too. One of the things that sets this particular location apart is that they have an active and ongoing Jaguar research project, and one that's very much geared towards um, developing Jaguar tourism, vehicle-based Jaguar tourism, so not boat-based, river-based Jaguar tourism, but vehicle-based Jaguar tourism in, in the same vein as an African safari would be. Indeed, when this project started, they sought consultant advice from people running, uh, running lodges in Southern Africa on how the African lodges had worked on habituating lions and leopards and so forth. And they started using those techniques with the jaguars. And this is going back 15 plus years. And obviously, from slow beginnings, things have gradually built up. But now there is a considerable head of jaguars at Cayman Lodge that are habituated and can be seen on vehicle-based safaris during the day and at night as well. You can go out at night looking for them, but also during the day, which obviously makes this quite an unusual place. So these are shots that were taken during the day of um, one of the habituated cats. Some of them do have collars on, but um, an awful lot of the cats now that have become more habituated don't have collars, obviously. Colored cats are less appealing photographically, but nonetheless, each year more and more cats are becoming tolerant, as are ocelots, which are generally seen on night drives at Cayman. Um, and as I mentioned, there's active research taking place with the jaguars. So there, here is one of the cattle that was being ranched that fell prey to a jaguar, um, which is tolerated because generally the cattle that are killed by jaguars are ones that are either sick or may have a broken limb or something so they're easy pickings. So this cow had been killed by a jaguar and the vets and various scientists had gone in actually to set a jaguar trap. They've developed a very humane noose trap um, that they're able to then catch jaguars so they can obviously take measurements and parameters and so forth, fit collars and track them. Um, so we were able to witness, as you would be if you stayed at Cayman Lodge and um, signed up for being part of the On Safari project, if there was any active research taking place, there they allow you to go and, um, and view the research uh, that's taking place. So we, we were able to see this sedated cat um, that was having veterinary attention. Um, this is the the vet that's um, uh, um, 
administering at the moment. Um, so we were able to watch all of the things that were taking place as part of the research and then see the antidote be given and the cat strategy wake up and wander off into night. So this was a young animal that needed a collar fitting and I think it had an injury. So they were wanting to check the injury. Um, so obviously that active research it just adds another element, another string to the bow of the experience of visiting Cayman Lodge. Obviously it being such a nice lodge does make it pricey. Um, and if you want to um, temper your expenditure a little, um, another place I would recommend, indeed I'd recommend to go to as well as Cayman Lodge, but if Cayman Lodge is beyond your means, then maybe just go to Agupe Lodge, which is a much more, um, much simpler, more basic, but still in very comfortable, charming lodge, which is very good standard indeed. Um, and is, 50 kilometers down dirt road off the main road and again is just fantastic for wildlife in and around the vicinity wonderful for toucans there's a river you can go out and view wildlife from but it's one of the best places for seeing giant anteaters and they're virtually seen every day at times around the lodge and you can get out on foot to view giant anteaters and get pretty close to them obviously at a respectful distance but if you're downwind and you keep still, they'll just wander past you. So all of these shots were taken down either at Cayman Lodge or at Agua Pay Lodge. Um, so that's, I hope, given you a, a broad outline of the Pantanal. I'm just going to finish off by mentioning a couple of locations that are worth considering if you wanted to, that are outside the Pantanal that are worth considering if you just wanted to add on an additional experience to a trip to Brazil. The first of these is just south of the Pantanal at Benito that you can see on the map there, where just outside Benito, there's a place called Buraco das Araras, the sinkhole of the macaws, which is just sensational for seeing red and green macaws. Um, it is a sinkhole it's a collapsed cavern and numerous pairs of macaws use it for roosting and nesting and two platforms have been built right on the edge of the cliff of the sinkhole for you to view the macaws either side of the sinkhole um, so this is obviously one of the platforms and this is a shot taken from that platform looking down into the sinkhole but it's a absolutely magnificent photographic experience particularly for the macaws lots of other bird life there as well but it's the macaws that are the real showstoppers here and at any one time there could be a dozen two dozen of the beautiful red and green macaws wheeling around um noisily weeding around the um the sinkhole which gives you the opportunity to get some sensational flight shots um flying beneath you, flying above you, flying to the side of you, etc. And one of the things that's most appealing is that often the far side of the wall of the sinkhole is in deep shadow, it's black, which means that when you get the macaws flying against it in sunlight, they just pop out like this and just create the most wonderful visual experience. So um, I think it's definitely worth a visit and on trips that I certainly do to the Southern Pantanal, we always go down and have two or three sessions photographing the cause um, at the sinkhole. And adjacent to Benito are several rivers, um, crystal clear rivers that you can swim in to view fish. Now, again, if we if you go back to the wetland episode of Green Planet, those of you who watched it, there was footage filmed on one of the rivers near Benito of this species of fish leaping out of the water to take seeds, etc. And you can actually go and snorkel in these rivers, drift down at a very sedate pace. The rivers are only a metre deep, half a metre deep. And so you, all you need is a, a buoyancy aid, a mask and a snorkel, which is provided by the lodge. And you drift down for 800 metres, maybe a kilometre, through effectively a giant aquarium. It's a magical experience. So again, I would always recommend that as something to consider if you're visiting the Southern Pantanal to tag on. The final recommendation 
really to any visit to Brazil, but certainly to a wildlife visit to the Pantanal, would be to go to Iguazu Falls, which is just absolutely sensational. And if you really want to treat yourself, make sure you stay at this place. This is Hotel Das Cataratas. I'm never really an advocate for staying at posh hotels for their own sake. I mean, my emphasis on any trips I do is always about what's really the best for the wildlife. But I would say if you're going to treat yourself to a really nice hotel, there are a few that are finer than this one, not only because the hotel is lovely, but also more importantly, because of the opportunities it affords you to view the falls that you cannot get any other way. The falls park is open from eight in the morning until six in the evening. And those of people staying in hotels that aren't inside the park can only visit at those times, which means you miss early morning and late evening. So you're only in the park in the middle of the day when it's hot and the wildlife viewing and the viewing of the falls is not at its best. If you stay at this place inside the park, you have 24 hour access to the falls, which means you can go out anytime to see, watch, photograph, which means most spectacularly at dawn, etc. Lots of wildlife to see around the falls, coates, you can even see jaguars if you get very lucky. When I was there, I didn't see one, but I saw footprints of jaguars very close to the hotel um, because there was a female with cubs that was living in the forest close by. So you know, all of the wildlife is there. Most people go to see the falls and during the day it gets massively busy. But as I stress, six o'clock at night, everyone else goes. So the only people there are people staying at that hotel. And you that, that stays the case until eight o'clock the following morning. So you can go down to visit the falls, which are colossal. There are over 200 separate cascades at various parts of the falls. So here you're on the Brazilian side, looking across to the Argentinian side of the falls, which visually is much more spectacular, being on the Brazilian side and looking across to the Argentinian side. This is moving right up towards the head of the falls. And again, these are all shots taken early in the morning when we're the only people there. In the middle of the day, you wouldn't have this. A, the light wouldn't be like it is, but B, there'd be lots and lots of other people. You wouldn't have them to yourselves. Lots of dusky swiftlets that nest. They fly through the waterfalls and nest in the cliffs, the other side of the water curtain. So you see them flying in and out. So here's an example of a dawn shot, which no one else will get. If you're staying outside, not in Das Cataratus, you wouldn't be able to get a shot like this. Roosting black vultures um, just on the edge of the falls and all of the wonderful mists that are formed by the cascading water. And this shot was taken at one o'clock in the morning. That's a silhouette of myself taken on a self typer. I'm the only person. I had Iguazu Falls to myself at one o'clock in the morning. So the advantages of staying at Das Cataratus are many. Um, it is a beautiful place. It's also worth, if you are able to stay longer, um, visiting the opposite side, which can be arranged through the hotel or certainly as part of the trip, the tour, to go to the Argentinian side, stand on the Argentinian side and looking back across to the Brazilian side of the falls. So these couple of shots are taken on the Argentinian side of the falls, which you have to visit during the middle of the day, of course, because you're only allowed in having left Brazil to go into Argentina. So you're visiting the falls in the middle of the day, but it's still worth it for one day. Um, to see the alternative. And one of the things that you might see are fantastic aggregations of butterflies, which seem incredibly common around the falls. Um, I think it is indeed my last slide. So I will hand back to Emma, because I know there's a Q&A and so forth, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that have come in um, while I've been chatting. Wow. I don't know about anyone else. I find I find something quite hypnotic about the Pantanal where it just feels like I'm there. And it, it feels like you just took me out of a meditation. <laughs> what <about> <laughs> oh, good. I hope everyone else felt like well. <laughs> it is. It is such an amazing place. Yeah. It's just so rich in wildlife. You, you can't help be wowed by it. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think I mean, from all the comments from myself and all the comments, I mean, amazing images and just an incredible place. And from those who have been already, they're loving reminiscing and from those who haven't they're very excited um as am i september can't come soon enough um 
So, well, I, am I allowed to put in a plug and say I'll be back there in early October? And I think there are four places left on my trip. So, well, uh, funny you should say that. So, um, as you mentioned the Q and A, I completely forgot at the beginning. I'm so sorry, but obviously you guys are much more on it than me. So, thank you for the questions that we've had. Um, there is a Q&A and a chat box. Use either to just um, pose any questions that you do have. In the meantime, I'm going to launch, hopefully, a poll uh, now. It should pop up. So this is um, four of our trips that we run to the Pantanal. There's a number that we have. Obviously, Nick mentioned he's got the Jaguar special um, later this year, and I believe there are still four spaces on that, if you're fast. Um, and then we've got the Brazil's Big Five Safari, which I'll be leading in September and October. Um, and then we've got the Wildlife of the Pantanal, which is our by far most popular trip, um, mostly around the Porto Joffre area. Um, but I know a few of you have been asking tonight, we've already booked something, how can you get extensions to these places? Just contact one of us, your travel consultants, and we will um, help you to arrange whether you want to go to Iguazu, to the South Pantanal, to go and look at the sinkhole, which I think has um, captured quite a lot of people. So yeah, just let us know. Um, so let's get started with some questions. Um, I think the first one, a few people have kind of asked about the fires and I know, you know, fires happen every year and, and I guess in some ways it's a bit like COVID, isn't it? The, the press gets hold of it and it's the worst thing that's ever happened. They happen every year. As far as I know, it's not a, a big issue, but I don't know if you wanted to add anything about it, you know, whether they um, affected it. Indeed, they, they are part and parcel of the Pantanal and some are deliberately started to clear areas, some are naturally started. So as you say, they happen every year. I know just prior to COVID, so two and a half, three years ago, the Pantanal suffered enormously with very, very extensive fires, far greater than um, you would say would be average. Now, I've obviously not been subsequent to that. Um, I do actually know some people that went literally just a month, two months after. Um, they went to Cayman Lodge, which was one area that was very badly adversely affected by those fires. And they still had a fantastic time because they said there were still huge areas that hadn't been affected by the fires and the wildlife had just gone to live in those areas. And of course, some of the wildlife had perished in the fires inevitably, but they didn't think that the wildlife viewing that they experienced had been compromised. Obviously, some of the areas they visited had visually been compromised because they were charred and burnt. But given that we're now three years down the line, my hunch is that um, those areas will have largely recovered because they'll have had three floods through them by now. And we know how quickly things grow and regrow. And because it's part of the natural cycle, um, uh, obviously, an awful lot of plants and so forth are, are used to it. In fact, I suspect some of them need the fire to germinate as going back to Green Planet. We saw that with some of the species um, in the fine boss, didn't we, uh, on the Green Planet? So um, part and parcel of the Pantanal ecosystem. And I, I wouldn't have thought it would massively compromise um, your experience. No, I think from the reports that we've had, it hasn't had any kind of adverse effects. I think, you know, the wildlife at that time is down by the river. Some of the fires are around the farmlands and yeah. the, the wildlife just heads towards the rivers. So I wouldn't worry too much. I think you, you may get some experience of fires around there if you go later in the season, but it shouldn't yeah. adversely affect your experience, whatever happens. Tends towards the end of September and October, yeah. the fires are more prevalent. That's when I went and I found it a little bit smoky during the middle of yes. the day. But to be honest, that's when you're back at the lodge anyway. So, yeah. you know, hopefully it, it shouldn't shouldn't have an effect. Um, right. Let's get a bit more specific. Um, how frequently can you expect to see armadillos and do you have to seek them out or are they readily visible? Um, it's a potluck thing, really. They're quite common and around some lodges. Um, think of one Agua Pay Lodge you'd see them daily. Um, so some lodges in the Southern Pantanal, you'd see them daily. They're harder to see in the North Pantanal and you certainly, I wouldn't say you could guarantee seeing them. You could, the ones I showed a picture of is a yellow or six banded armadillo. You might also see nine banded. There are several other species. The most sought after and hardest to see is giant armadillo, of course, which I've never seen, but they are there. 
Um, so again, some lodges, they're much more common and you will see them almost daily, others less so, and you may see them, you may not. Yeah, I'd say, I mean, I again, saw- early, early in the morning is the best time yeah. because they're out bumbling yeah. and off. Agua Pay Lodge, they're very tolerant. I, mean, I, I was able to pick one up at Agua Pay Lodge. Um, however, most places, when they see you, they'll just trundle off and straight down their burrow. <clears throat> yeah, that's what I was going to say. I think, I think I saw three, but most of it was just the pointy bum and the tail yeah. going into a hole. Yeah. And no matter how much I waited outside the hole, they did not want to come no, back They're out. not going to come back out. <laughs> no. Um, great. Okay. Um, do jaguars have individually distinguishable patterns? Good question. Short answer, yes. I certainly am not good enough to do it. So those conducting research will try to photograph both left and right flank, and then they can be distinguished once you're familiar. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, other features can make certain individuals more easily identifiable. But a jaguar's spot pattern, if you have both left and right flank, is unique. But obviously, you need to be uh, well versed and a pretty expert to be able to discern them. Interestingly, you know, I was sort of alluding to how many jaguars there may or may not be in those areas along the Cuiaba River. Um, Panthera, one the world's leading cat conservation organization have had a research project along that river for oh, 15 plus more 20 years now um and i got to know some of the staff there during the course of my trips and i've sent them pictures of cats and bear in mind they're there all the time virtually and i sent them pictures of jaguars and then on a couple of occasions said we don't know what's on this is it's not one we recognize so that kind of alludes to the turnover of cats that exist um, there. So, yeah, you, some are recognisable, but um, mm. um, not everyone, that's for sure. Mm. And I think there's there's quite a nice, if, when you go, especially on things like the Wildlife of the Pantanal, where you're up slightly further away from kind of the, the main area. Yeah. A lot of the guides said they do it every day. They've done it every day for years. So, you know, they know either the area where the jaguars are going to be or they know it from the facial you know you can see from some of Nick's yeah. images some of the eyes particularly the are eyes different particular, and, yes yeah they're quite um recognizable so that yes. that does make it easier so often the guide will be able to tell you which jaguar it is and you might see it multiple times during your trip so um that is quite nice um you've been dazzling with your uh photoshop skills there's some people asking how you do the um montage images if you could do a Cliff Notes version, maybe. <laughs> okay. Oh God. Uh, what notes version? Cliff. Uh, Cliff Notes. <laughs> uh, pass. What's that? Um, anyway, um, <laughs> they're, they're each individual. Each individual image is just opened as a separate layer, and then you just reveal it through the layer behind. So it takes a long time to build it up, but that was a sequence, and I, I only used every third image because. The camera is obviously taking images so quickly that if you used every image, there'd be all of the, each of the cats would overlap. So you need to miss out two images so the space between each cat. Um, but that those montages took a fair amount of time to put together. Um, someone that's really good at Photoshop would probably do it in a quarter of the time. But um, um, yeah, because I'd got such a nice sequence of the cat running, I just thought it was a nice thing to do. Fab. Um, do you and the team hold any informal lectures or talks in the evenings? Um, I know some of the, the lodges do, but I don't know if you want to talk about I, that. Uh, certainly on any of my trips, Pantanal, anywhere else in the world, um, the tuition side of things with respect to photography is um, always there, always available, as much or as little as people want. And if I have something of particular note or interest we happily will sit down in the evenings um, the Pantanal does allow that because there aren't too many options for going out at night for instance at, if you were staying at Portage Offer you wouldn't go out at night and um, certainly wouldn't go walking around at night because you might bump into a jag um, 
So you have options for sitting around over a drink in the evening and going through something in an informal way. So I wouldn't generally set up something formally, but if there's something specific people want to go through, um, whether it be camera related stuff, Lightroom related stuff, or general wildlife stuff, it doesn't have to necessarily be about photography. I will always sit down in the evening and chat things through with one person, a couple, or an entire group, depending on who is interested. Nice. And often, um, especially on things like the wildlife of the Pantanal, the, the company that runs the lodges there, some of their scientists are, are often around. So they yes. will do a lunchtime lecture or an evening lecture, which yeah. you can choose to go along to. But it's quite a nice way yeah. to learn a bit more. You know, they'll do something about giant otters or jaguars and they'll give you, you know, the facts from the local area, which is quite an interesting way to spend sure. half an hour of your break. Um, so... Would you still recommend this trip for someone who's phobic of snakes? Yes. Um, I put snake pictures in because I love snakes. I know an awful lot of people are less keen. Um, you really only go see snakes if you go looking for them. Yes, you might see an anaconda slither across the lawn of the lodge, but it doesn't happen very often. Um, so as is the case virtually anywhere in the world, most of the time snakes keep themselves to themselves and you don't see them. Um, you only see them if you really go looking for them. Um, so I wouldn't let my um, bias towards snakes put anybody off because you, you wouldn't come across them very often, if at all, on a normal trip. You might see them at a distance, but you know, slithering across the road, you know, uh, I don't know if you have them on your trips, but you know, a handful of times I've seen an anaconda slither across the road and you get out and you look at it from 50 yards away or whatever, and that's that. We'll stay in the vehicle. <laughs> uh, we'll stay in the vehicle, but you know, they're, they're utterly harmless. You give them space and they're fine. Yeah. I mean, I was there a good probably two weeks and I saw one yellow anaconda in the river as well. So yeah. it's really not uh, not you know, you're not going to kind of see them slithering across the path in front of no. you while you're walking. So I wouldn't worry about it. Um, so a bit more about weather. Um, mm. I can I can do a bit of that. I mean, basically, we run trips to the Pantanal from May to October. That's the time that you can go. And essentially from May, the river starts to lower. So it's the beginning of the dry season. The rain stops, the, the river gets lower and the wetlands dry up. Um, so obviously the temperature starts rising from May and is warmest in October. Um, it's It can be quite humid and the boats aren't covered. So I know Nick was saying shorts and shorts and short sleeve tops. We do recommend long sleeves. Um, mm -hmm. That's probably more for people like me who burn to a crisp um, in that kind of sun, but definitely kind of hats and fans and things but you know while the boat is moving actually it's not too bad it's more you know when you're stopped and if you find a jaguar you can sit and you know watch it for an hour or two potentially yeah and a, another thing for people to consider i certainly know clients that have been with me have done this is is take a small packable umbrella and use it as a parasol so on in those occasions where you're having to sit out and wait for something to happen you're staking something out because you know there's a cat or whatever and it gets warm, you, know, you can have a little parasol, a little umbrella to use as a parasol to protect yourself, and um, it works a treat. Yeah. We used to use or have been in places where there are covered, the boats are covered, which intuitively you might think is a good idea, but it's monumentally frustrating, and I hate it, because whenever you're bird watching, you can never see anything that's flying over. It makes you feel so enclosed, and the posts that hold up the roof get in the way of your lens all the time so they're a nightmare so I would always 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 advocate boats that are not covered and you take appropriate action to protect yourself from the sun um and then just really a few questions about kit um mm -hmm. battery charging all that kind of thing all the lodges are really well set up for all the lodges the are well set up there's, yeah. there's always plugs sockets everywhere so um don't worry at all about that um sometimes you need a funny adapter for brazil that's yeah. yeah 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 we can send photos of that if you need yeah. um your recommendations for lenses um if you're doing jaguar stuff then 
minimum 300, ideally 400 or even a 500. Um, so a lot of people would use a 100 to 400 or 80 to 400 if you're Nikon. Um, that sort of thing is the most popular lens. Obviously, if you're into bigger lenses, faster lenses, you can use those uh, with either a monopod or a tripod. Around the lodges, lenses like that for birds are perfectly adequate. So, a, you know, a three or 400 mil. Um, so most, it's not dissimilar to the way you would approach an African safari. Most of what you do is vehicle based, whether that be a road vehicle or a boat. And the wildlife you're viewing is more, it can be close, but it's still at a distance where you're going to need some sort of telephoto generally. Um, so I tend to take lens, I would take a 200 to 400 and a 600, for instance. Um, but if you're hand holding, obviously a smaller lens, um, like a 100 to 400 or something like that, would be perfectly adequate most of the time. Yeah. Um, and your Jaguar special, you end with the four nights at the Cayman. Do you go to the sinkhole while you're there? I, gosh, um, you've put me on the spot. I know, um, sorry. I can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember. I can't remember. Tell you what, Florence, we'll look for you and we'll let you know. <laughs> I think we do. I'd be very surprised if we like don't. You. Um, I'm sure you do. The, we go to the three main Jaguar locations. So Porto Joffrey, Paraguay River and Cayman Lodge, and I'm pretty certain we included a couple of nights at the sinkhole as well. I'm so sorry, I can't remember. Of course, with the last two years, things have drifted into the back of my mind and I, the specifics of the itinerary. Um, I, I know it's the three main Jaguar locations and I can't remember if we included the sinkhole or if that was an optional add-on. Yeah, so we'll come back to you and then again, that's a little bit like if you, um, you know, if you're doing one of the other trips, you can add anything as an extension if it's not included anyway. Um, oh, look, Stephen's more on it than us. Doesn't go to the sinkhole, they've added it separately. Okay, is that Stephen <laughs> Louise? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yes. Yeah, great, okay. Um, any problems on internal flights with cameras and luggage allowance? Um, yeah, okay. Ready that, question. <laughs> Yeah, inevitably, it can be a bit of a challenge at times. I've occasionally had difficulty uh, on a couple of internal flights and use one of those jackets where you can laden it up with 10 kilos of kit and so forth. And um, But most of the time I've managed to find a way to get around it. And I do check a Peli case in at times and pay for additional luggage. Um, so... Obviously, that's a choice I take, but there are times you just have to be a little bit sneaky and to get a, a heavier camera bag through. So I tend to have, wear one of those or carry one of those jackets with me that I can laden up with heavy stuff to reduce the weight of the actual bag. Perfect. OK, um, I think that's probably most things. There's a few people very uh, interested in the refreshments at the uh, hotels. There are definitely uh, lots of refreshments available of many types. The Kuiperinias are amazing. So anyone <laughs> there should maybe try something new. <laughs> um, generally speaking, um, there is no best time to go. I don't know if you disagree, but I think any time between May and October, you are likely to see most or all of the things that you've talked you about. Well, I suppose the one thing I'd say is um, the later you leave it, the less water is, the more concentrated things become. Mm. Um, July and August tends to be busier with more people. Once you get into September and certainly into October, the number of other visitors drops off because it's getting so hot. Um, so that's a consideration at times um, for some yeah. people. It's always a balance, really, isn't it? I mean, you it go is. earlier in August, you get those beautiful pink flowers, you know, in, yes. the, in the trees, whereas later in September, October, it's a bit more sparse because it's obviously so much drier and hotter. But 
like Nick says, you do tend to see more probably around the river areas, but yeah. you definitely, you, you never know. Um, and on the boat trips, you don't stop for a break. I know somebody's asked um, that it's not, it's not like the African safaris where you kind of stop for sundowners or anything. You do just go out. And you do just go out. There are, there are always drinks in the boat. We have a cool box yeah. with drinks in the boat. So everyone always has plenty of water and we'll stock up with soft drinks as well. Um, so there's always drinks in the boat, but obviously you have to be mindful. There aren't loos and it's perfectly feasible to stop for a loo break, but a loo break is a sandbar because obviously you can't have people wandering behind bushes. Um, so you, know, you have to be aware that privacy on loo breaks, I mean, obviously we do try to make sure there's a bit of privacy um, where needed, uh, but you can't just willy nilly stop. You've got to be very careful where you stop because quite literally there could be a jaguar sleeping under any bush. Yeah. Okay, I think we might have done it. Um, Super. Well, <laughs> yeah. I hope everyone's enjoyed um, it. So yeah, I hope everybody's enjoyed the evening. And obviously, you know, you've seen the poll. Um, please do let us know if you want any more information. Um, email us, um, Nick. I don't know if you've got the last slide on there. Uh, I'm trying to get it up, and my <laughs> my computer has frozen, and I'm struggling. I'm afraid. I'm ah! sorry. Love technology. But yeah, if you let us know either on the poll or if you email us um, at sales at wildlife worldwide or email, oh, there we are. hey, any of the consultants, um, then we'll be able to answer any questions or if you want any travel plan sending, if you want any extensions booked, just let us know. Um, if you haven't booked yet and um, your, uh, well, Nick's helped to whet your appetite. Uh, there are spaces on all four of the trips that we've put in the poll. Um, as we said, Nick's trip still has space and he's got a couple of other trips this year that I believe you you still have one or two. I do. Um, just a last minute heads up in case anyone's interested. We've just had a cancellation on uh, my Serengeti Tanzania trip uh, leaving at the end of March. Um, so if anyone would like to consider that there is one space available for a single traveler um, leaving towards the end of March for the migration in Southern Serengeti. Perfect. Um, so yeah, anybody who is looking to book, there is a special offer. So if you just um, let us know with that code that's on the screen there, the BRT Zoom, then you get hundred pounds off per person. Um, and then uh, if we haven't sent you all to sleep and you'd like to join us again, uh, unfortunately it's me next I'm sorry uh, on Tuesday myself and Brett are talking about some UK wildlife photography oh god and then it's me again I'm so sorry uh, on the 3rd of March I'll be talking to you about primates um, so yeah unless there's anything else Nick I think we'll say thank you I and think, good night yeah thank you for listening everyone um, hope you enjoyed it and um, have a enjoy the rest of your evening perfect thanks everyone